Welcome and thank you for joining the Irrigation Association's 2022 Agriculture Faculty Academy. My name is Doreen Rich and I will be facilitating your session today. But before we dive into the session itself, which is basics of fertigation, chemigation, and regulatory impacts, I did want to take a moment to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, we have muted everyone's microphones so that we won't just be disturbed by any latecomers. So please keep your microphones muted throughout the session unless you have a question. And in that case, you can go ahead and take yourself off and go ahead and ask that verbally. This will help minimize any background noise and kind of make sure everybody can get the best quality sound out of the session itself. So secondly, during the presentation, um, as mentioned, if you have questions, you can take yourself off of mute and ask them verbally. You can also utilize the chat box, which I will be monitoring throughout the session itself. There is also a raise your hand feature that you can utilize. And if I see that um, happen, I will also call upon you and you can take yourself off mute and ask your question. Lastly, we do encourage interactivity. So feel free to have your video on throughout the session. As mentioned, interject with questions throughout the session and also maybe introduce yourself and where you teach at um, via the chat box that we will be all watching throughout the session as well. So that's it for the housekeeping. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome our speaker, Jake LaRue, who is an independent irrigation consultant, and he's going to go ahead and take over screen share now. Um, we're going to dive right in. Stay current uh, with what is uh, re going on with permits and with your particular uh, organization. This slide shows uh, data. Uh, it's based on the 2018 uh, USDA irrigation survey, uh, the top five crops, which to me, I mean, I was shocked how much corn it was um, and certainly overwhelms the rest of the crops. Uh, the states by millions of acres, Nebraska leads, then Texas, Kansas, California, and this includes all types of reported irrigation. So there could be uh, surface irrigation. There's certainly potential for drip, a micro spray, uh, could even be traveling guns included. Uh, but it kind of gives us a sense of the scale of some of these. And then the relationship between fertigation and chemigation. Uh, in most cases, the chemigation is half or less than what we would see uh, with the fertigation. Am I coming through okay, Noreen? Yep, we can see you and hear you just fine. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I Obviously, this is really confusing when I can't see or really know what's going on in the group, so I apologize. So anyway, basics. Uh, we're gonna talk about some fundamentals, talk about sustainability. That's a word that's kicked around a lot. Uh, where fertigation and chemigation are good fits and there's some places they're not. And a little on regulatory considerations. Hardware, what we need for equipment wise. Impact on the center pivot. Probably another question I get frequently from the dealers is, well, is it gonna hurt my pivot? Um, We'll talk about the conclusions. And if I haven't burned up all the time, we'll have an opportunity for a little question and comments at the end. Okay, fundamentals. Fertigation and chemigation are all about the application of materials in the irrigation water to aid in the production of crops. Uh, I'm sure everybody has slightly different ideas of what this is but that's kind of it in a nutshell. Now I wanna to touch on uh, sustainability and I look at it from two perspectives. One, the farmer's perspective. His access needs to have water resources and economics come into play. So often we look at it from one side or the other. The other side of this is the environment perspective. We don't want to delete water, freshwater stocks over time. Well, nobody does. And we want to protect the water quality. So we can't totally look at one or the other if we're really going to uh, proceed and have good performance and continue to produce crops. 
Okay, mentioned earlier, our focus is on center pivots. Uh, a lot of the information for center pivots does not apply to surface or traveling guns, drip or micro spray. There's different hardware and particularly different management requirements. In some cases, products can be used in one that can't be used in the other. So I apologize to those of you that were wanting an overall general discussion. This is gonna be focused on pivots. So why might fertigation chemigation be something good for my farm? Well, one, something else I can do with my pivot. I mean, I water, why can't I do other things? Uh, years ago, we had the seed gator that was tried and different manufacturers have done different things. So we can utilize it. It's a good tool. I can turn it on and it goes by itself, basically. The big factor is applying fertilizers and chemicals when needed, with the amount needed, rather than pre-plant applying all of my nitrogen needs for the year, uh, being concerned about runoff and particularly leaching. So this gives us a chance to really better manage our product. Often the costs are lower to apply with a center pivot than a ground rig or an airplane. Um, we'll see some numbers a little later on specifically on that. But you've made the investment in the center pivot the investment in the chemigation equipment is not huge by any means. So it's something to think about as you go forward. The other thing you can do with a center pivot and gets overlooked a lot of times is incorporation, not really incorporation, but activation of herbicides. Didn't apply it with the pivot. We applied it with a ground rig, but it didn't rain. We didn't have a chance to get in to do any light tillage. Uh, maybe it's more of a no-till situation. So I can run my pivot around, put on a light application, you know, a half inch of water to activate that product to help me as I go forward. And hopefully that makes a little sense to y'all. There's probably many of you there that know much more about the nitrogen transformation, and I'm not gonna try to talk about that. Uh, this picture shows a number of transformations. What I'm concerned about is the movement. Uh, where does it go? The runoff with erosion, uh, the deep leaching of the nitrate nitrogen. All of those are going to potentially impact my sustainability. And we know that the water movement is going to be dependent on the soils. Tillage practices, certainly no-till and minimum tillage has really helped significantly. Uh, rainfall or lack thereof. And the field characteristics themselves are something to consider um, when you're looking at do I want to try chemigation and or fertigation? If we look, and I'm gonna mostly be talking about corn. I apologize, uh, I've got more experience with corn. Uh, certainly a lot of the same types of curves and data exist for, I know for potatoes, uh, for sugarcane, which probably not a crop many of you are involved with. I have worked with sugarcane in South America. Um, so the data exists, but what I'm presenting generally is gonna be about corn. And the graph to the right, what it's showing is, I had to put all of my nitrogen down ahead of time, all pre-plant. So it's all subject to potential loss runoff and or leaching. To the right side, I am spoon feeding the crop. And you can see that as I put on a little bit, well, that little bit is exposed to the potential for leaching or runoff, but it certainly isn't near the potential as it is on the left side. So why do I wanna put all of my nitrogen down pre-plant? And 
do I truly know what my yield is going to be at that particular point? Um, well, this is a horrible slide and I apologize. I just happened to run into it. Um, we don't want to list risk leaching and runoff. And in this case, it's runoff. Unfortunately, I have seen uh, center pivot fields with some topography change where we see this kind of um, events happening, which is certainly not something good and certainly is going to contribute to losses. Again, looking at uptake patterns. This is for corn. At 50 days post-emergence, I've used about 20% of my nitrogen. If I applied all pre-plant, I've been exposed to a lot of opportunities for losses. So again, do we want to apply everything pre-plant pre or not? And it's another reason for fertigation. For sustainability standpoint, typically we'll see people say that you need about 1.2 pounds per bushel for the nitrate nitrogen. Um, grower that I know always said he was raising 200 bushel corn and he always applied 240 pounds per acre of anhydrous ammonia uh, pre-plant. But, and he learned the hard way, what's gonna happen during the growing season? Uh, I know one year in particular, he had a huge amount of rain right after planting and crop emergence was poor, lots of problems. And depending on the soil type and the rainfall, uh, easily can have losses of five to 25% of your earlier applied nitrogen. So how about we apply the nitrogen when the crop needs it and the amount needed? Uh, using the pivot saves my time, don't have to do, spend a lot on it. I cut back on potential compaction, minimize costs, and overall goal, we minimize runoff and leaching. And you can see for the different characteristics here, like at V3, when we finish that crop stage, we've used about 10 pounds. By the time we get to silking, we've used about 135 pounds of N. So this is something that would be considered uh, rather than having it all on up front to minimize our losses. And we never know what our crop's gonna be looking like as we get out further. Okay, why are fertigation and chemigation maybe not a good fit? Well, one is significant variations in the field. Uh, that earlier slide with the runoff uh, that was because of the topography. Uh, they did not use grass waterways or buffer zones. And so that can be a problem. Certainly variable rate irrigation can overcome some of that using either speed, which does an amazingly good job depending on the situation, or spend the money and put on zone control. Uh, does wonderful and we'll be looking at some more slides about that later on. Uh, what about the corners of the field? Well, what can I say? Um, many of the pivots, uh, they don't plant the corners as we go further west because they just don't have the water. Uh, you could add a cornering pivot to it, add the corner arm available from all the manufacturers. So there are some different options. None of them are perfect solutions. Uh, one thing that I've noticed recently where people are planting straight through to the corners is they are using variable rate planting and they'll use a lower population. So it has lower demand on water and nutrients. Something else people say might not be a good fit is poor uniformity. Hello. If you got poor for uniformity for fertigation, what's that say about your water pattern? And I actually had a grower say this, and I was like, come on, get real. You need good uniformity for your watering anyway. 
So what, what are you trying to say and accomplish? Uh, end guns. And you can argue all day long about end guns. Um, can they do a good job or not? Fertigation, probably okay. Chemigation depends a lot on the product. And in a lot of cases, it's probably a waste to run the end gun. I know you got acres out there, you want to cover them, you want to make sure it's treated, but doesn't do any good to treat it poorly and waste the money. And as you all know, fertilizer and chemicals, they're really expensive this year. Uh, the last item is potential for drift out of the target area. The sprinkler package comes into play, makes a lot of difference and we want to watch our wind speeds. But these same factors impact if we're applying with a ground rig, though less so, and certainly does apply to uh, air applications. So it's just something to consider. Okay, another reason may not be a good fit, which I think is a poor one, limited to nitrogen. We can only realistically apply nitrogen successfully. Now, some of you can argue that point. I know uh, Steve Melvin is there. Um, he's probably had experience where others have been applied, but realistically, potassium and phosphorus do not move with water much. So they're not going to leach out. They're not gonna to tend to run off in water. Um, they're probably much more economical to apply by ground and or band with the planter. And I know that slows you down when you're planting if you're banding, but um, can be an efficient way to do things. So normally we're just going to be talking about application of nitrogen when we're talking about fertigation. The other one, and this just came up, I think Wednesday, no, that was yesterday, it must have been Tuesday, had a dealer call me about foliar feeding with a pivot. I'm sorry, doesn't work. True foliar feeding. I mean, true foliar feeding with talking to the pioneer folks, you're talking three to eight gallons per acre of being applied. With a pivot, putting on a 10th of an inch, I'm putting down over 2,700 gallons per acre. So you understand, uh, what the situation is. Later in the season, yes, you got a full canopy, but then the foliar feeding usually isn't as, a, as good. So just be aware, when we talk about foliar feeding, we really probably aren't going to talk about pivots. Okay. Um, regulatory considerations. I see somebody raised a hand, Noreen. Is that something we need to respond to? Yep, it looks like is it Ahmed, right? Yeah, Jacob, would you mind if you can explain what is uh, foliar feed means? Because I don't have experience with this term. Ah, okay. Generally, and I apologize for that. Generally, it's the application of micronutrients. It is a, you would spray it over the crop. Um, if you see signs, I've seen uh, zinc deficiencies in corn sometimes where they will apply it if you've had a cold, damp spring. So typically you would use a ground rig and you would be carrying a micronutrient mixture and be applying directly to the crop canopy and it would be absorbed, most of it, through the leaves. Um, even that is not the most efficient way to do things, but um, from a rescue standpoint, it can be of help. Uh, does that make a little sense? Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Um, hope that makes sense. Um, okay, regulatory. You got to understand the product label. Touched on that before. Is the product suitable for chemigation? Hello, a lot of the products that you would see in the market, probably the majority, they're not labeled for chemigation and they're not labeled for center pivot chemigation. They may be labeled for drip or other forms of irrigation. And there's many products that are only labeled for center pivots. 
So you need to really know your labels, understand what they're saying, and understand that there are variations, unfortunately, state to state, even in some district to district uh, in the regulatory licensing permitting requirements. So you really need to visit with someone to make sure you're on top of what the requirements are. Okay, so we've talked about labels. The following, there's several slides here, and it's for Ambush 2EC, which is an insecticide. The text is actually what is on the label. I took the label and I broke it into pieces to make it easier to understand. So the first line says chemigation, good. Sprinkler irrigation, excellent. Now I said center pivots, but a lot of times they just call sprinkler irrigation the application meaning center pivots. Uh, it says apply at rates and timing described elsewhere. Okay, I didn't put, put all that in, just the part relating to pivots. Here's a key point. It says apply with center pivot one half acre inch or less. Critical when you're chemigating to apply what the label says. Uh, half inch is pretty high amount. A lot of them are quarter inch or even less, some down to a tenth of an inch, depending on the product. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, it goes on to talk about you need a functional check valve. Well, duh, I'm sure all farmers do, hope they do. And we're gonna talk in a little more detail on that. So continuing on with this example, um, the, the actual label says the pesticide injection pipeline must contain a functional automatic quick release check valve to prevent flow back into the injection pump. This would be at the actual point of injection into the pipeline. Uh, probably Mr. Mister from Agri-Inject is one of the most common of these type. And it includes a quick closing check valve because we, that's right, we don't want water or anything else flowing back towards our pump. The next one is something relatively new. Um, I shouldn't say new, it's all, I guess I had not seen it anyway until recently. Uh, the label for an ambush says you need to have a normally closed solenoid operated valve between the injection pump and the tank. And encircled in red is number item number 12, which is all about that solenoid. And you can see the wiring going through 15 goes into the pivot panel. So that's your interlock. So what happens is as long as your pivot is up and running, the injection pump is running the, and you've got electricity flowing to the solenoid valve, it's open, but you lose power, it automatically closes. I'm not sure why this is becoming more common but it is something that we're seeing more. And it depends on where you're at. If you're in a state where they do inspections, um, they might actually pick up on this. Not sure if they would or not. Uh, a lot of states, they don't actually come out and inspect your installation, which probably is unfortunate. Continuing on on the label, uh, you need to have interlocking controls between the injection pump and the uh, irrigation pump. And in our case, the control panel, they're all tied together. So if anyone stops, everybody stops. And the irrigation line uh, should have a functional pressure switch. So if the water go pressure goes down, it's gonna stop everything. And why are we concerned if the water pressure decreases? Well, we need to understand our pivot characteristics, but if it drops much, that means there's probably something wrong and our uniformity is going to be poor. Fertigation, not quite as critical. Chemigation, it can be very critical. So you need to be aware of that and what the implications might be. Uh, continuing on with the label for the ambush insecticide, 
systems must use a metering pump that is positive displacement. Uh, the picture there happens to be agri inject pump also. That is a diaphragm pump. It is positive displacement. Um, it, this label goes on to say that needs to be designed and constructed with materials that are compatible with pesticides and capable of being fitted with system interlock, which yes, that's all easy enough to do. What this is saying is Venturi type uh, delivery systems for the uh, chemigation really are not adequate. And they, that's why they're recommending uh, using a positive displacement pump. <clears throat> um, I hope all or most of you anyway got this picture and I was told it's way too complex. Well, I don't believe that. I believe you all are smart people. You can figure out what's going on. Real quickly, items one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 18 and 19, those are all standard pivot type of equipment. Uh, number eight is the um, pressure uh, transducer. 18 and 19, of course, are the sprinkler package. Now then, on the other side of this, we have the fertigation chemigation side, which is items 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And I think it's pretty straightforward. We've talked about 12, 13 is the injection pump. The one added thing is there's a little note on there that says levy and it's kind of in brown. There are some irrigation districts that require a levy around the tank that will contain the product if there is a uh, catastrophic failure. Uh, a little leak is one thing, but if uh, something happens and it splits so that you contain everything and it doesn't immediately run someplace and start soaking into the ground. So this is another reason you need to be aware of what your requirements are for permitting and regulation is, do I need a levy or not around my tank? Okay, let's look at some of the hardware briefly here. And we'll see that the, uh, this is a check valve, um, chemigation check valve. And I'm sorry, I don't care if you're gonna chemigate or not, you're putting in a new installation, you ought to put in a chemigation check valve. It's just plain better. Flow meter, not really required, but it's just good to have. Our tank. Do we want non-corrosive material, easy to fill? Um, showing a horizontal tank here and also a vertical tank. You wanna size them for at least to apply enough fertilizer for one rotation, preferably more. And you need to look at convenience of delivery to the field when you're sizing it. Don't go with a tiny dinky tank if you can avoid it. Now, on the flip side of this is chemigation. Often your chemigation products, you're applying a really small amount. I mean, with fertigation, we may be applying 10 to 20 gallons per hour. So when we're doing that, it's gonna add up depending on our pivot speed. So a smaller tank can be very beneficial and simplify things for chemigation. Also, you may not have your fertigation pump, may not also work for chemigation to get you the right dosage. And the nice thing on this particular setup is it does have an agitation. Uh, this little electric motor here, there's a shaft that runs down in a tank and a propeller to provide agitation. Uh, mechanical agitation for most products is a good way to go, but you can have foaming which can cause you some problems and need to consider air agitation. Here's examples of the different possible pumps. Um, just there's a lot of them out there. This is not all of them by far. 
they have different characteristics. The two to the right are both diaphragm. The left one is the injectometer, been around a long time, and it is a piston pump. There are some distinct advantages with the diaphragm pumps when it comes to calibration and adjustment. This is another critical point, and this is where we inject into the riser pipe. <coughs> Excuse me. Using a Mr. Mister, there are other ones out there, but Mr. Mister is a nice package because it will give us a little spray pattern in here so it get better mixing in the riser pipe. It has an air bleed on it to bleed off air because you're gonna be air locked often when you start up the first time. So you're trying to fill this and you got air in there, it's causing problems. So we wanna bleed off the air and the check valve is right in here. And I don't know what I did wrong, but I've got this installed incorrectly because the air bleed has to be on the top side and not the bottom. Evidently, I flipped this whole thing over and I apologize for that. But just please note, you need the air bleed on the top, not on the bottom because it's got to let the air out. Uh, the sprinkler packages. What am I wanting to accomplish? Am I applying a systemic or a contact product? And depending on what we're doing, uh, for instance, the above canopy package to the left be good for ambush because I'm applying over the top of the corn. The in canopy to the right, certainly good if I'm doing uh, systemic type products because they got to go into the root system anyway and come back up to the plant, certainly good for fertigation. And it's going to be efficient. Wind's not going to impact me very much. So you need to be aware of what's my package I've got, what products do I want to try to apply? Okay, here's, I don't know if you can see it, but on the right here, there's water spraying out of the pipeline. Not a good thing. Um, I get, I don't know how many calls I've had this year already about will fertilizers cause corrosion in my pipeline? Normally not. The big challenge is the irrigation water itself. Uh, that's what we found, it did a bunch of testing over a couple of years and it was the water itself, not the, um, urea or the uh, liquid fertilized. It helps and you should always flush after you apply but it's really not going to typically impact the pipeline. Uh, there are industry uh, alternatives. We've got poly pipe, uh, poly lined and poly span are three different uh, trade names of uh, where they use a polyethylene liner in the galvanized pipe. It works very well. Uh, I've done some soil remediation with some acids that would uh, eat a pivot galvanized pipe up in no time, but with uh, the line pipe did a good job. Something else to be aware of, because everybody wants to try something. Cool, that's wonderful. Um, we want to do a jar test. And what we're doing is putting in a, normally a glass jar. You can go on the internet and it'll give you full instructions. Put water in it. Make sure you use the water that's at the pivot point. <coughs> not water from your faucet, okay? Put it in the jar, put a little bit of whatever the chemical product is, the same ratio if possible. Um, shake it up a little bit, see what happens. You can see in this particular case, see that white stuff on the surface may not show up well enough for you. The, there's been uh, flocculation and solids coming out of suspension inside the tank. And is that good news for our sprinkler package or our regulators? Of course it's not. Uh, also, uh, I know quite a few customers that try to apply 1034-0. Not sure why, but they think it's the thing to do. And they will have plugging issues. It depends on the water chemistry. 
Typically, the lower pH, they have more problems with uh, plugging. I believe that's right. But for sure, would want to do a jar test if they were insisting on using 10340 so they don't plug things up. Okay, we've run through this very quickly. I see there, I saw a hand had been raised and I ignored it. Um, not sure of the time, Noreen, should we go to questions now or what do you suggest? Because I have yeah, sure. conclusions. Sure, I mean, um, Ahmed, if you wanna uh, come off mute and ask your question now and then maybe you can wrap up with your conclusions, that'd be great, Jake. Yeah, for sure. So thank you, uh, Noreen. And uh, my question is related to the polypipe as alternative to reduce the corrosion. So would you mind if you can explain this? So how is this? Like, this is like a film material that's inside the pivot pipe itself or, or how this works? Yes, it, uh, it's not real thin. Um, it's a polyethylene material that is put inside the pipe uh, it is uh, treated with heat and pressure to make it to shrink it and pushed into the pipe and then it grows back, so to speak. Uh, it's kind of weird how it will fill in and seal up and then the holes are drilled to put in the uh, sprinkler package uh, nozzles and stuff. Um, and I apologize, I'm not giving a very good explanation, but it's, it's uh, and I don't remember the thickness on it. Um, they, no matter the manufacturer, they've got some thickness to them. And it's, uh, it's a very good product and uh, it will last, no question about it. Great. The reason I'm asking this, Jake, because in Arkansas, uh, most of growers are using uh, poly pipes for service irrigation. Oh. Uh, yeah, and even growers are shifting from pivots to center pivot, I'm sorry, from pivots to surface because it's kind of cheap for to pump and cheap to use poly pipes once a year. So I'm just I was thinking how it works with, with pivots. That poly pipe is not the same. Okay. What they put in a liner would be like what you would find at a hardware store that's got a thickness of, I don't know, uh, Steve, if you're right there. What is it? Maybe a quarter inch thick? Eh, not that thick. Yeah, um, an eight, eighth inch probably. Eighth inch probably um, that goes into the pipe. The poly pipe used for surface irrigation is mm -hmm. not the right material because it's too going to be too prone to tearing as it's pushed through the pipe. Okay. Thank you so much, Jake. Great, and um, Jake, I'm just looking here. I don't see any questions in the chat box, but if anybody does have any, oh. if you want to submit them now or raise your hand as well and come off mute. But if you want to run through your conclusions and then maybe if you want to just touch upon um, the next session that's happening later on this afternoon, um, you know, how they, this presentation relates to that, that might be useful. Okay. Jake, I would just add one comment. You did an excellent job. Jake and I talked a little bit on this ahead of time and, and uh, I work with the University of Nebraska Extension and done a lot with chemigation over the years. The only thing I would add to what you said, Jake, because you did an excellent job of covering it, is that in Nebraska, where we pump a lot of fertilizer on the corn, a lot of times this time of year when we're wanting to pump nitrogen on, um, it's rained and we really don't need the irrigation water. And so the one number that you might want to toss out there is if you can put about 50 pounds of nitrogen, maybe 60 pounds of nitrogen on with a quarter inch of water. And in order to do that, you probably need a chemigation pump that'll pump, you know, 80 to 100 gallons an hour to pump it on that quickly at that, you know, moving the pivot basically almost at full speed to put on as little water as you can with the nitrogen. And so I, that's the only thing I'd add, Jake, but you did a great job and uh, commend you for your presentation. Well, thank you. And, and you are correct. Um, I guess I'm kind of a believer in uh, not putting all my fertilizer down through the pivot and having some applied ahead of time. Uh, but you are correct, and a, one pump that I showed, I think, was a 55-gallon-per-hour pump, which would not handle that. Uh, you would need to jump up in size to probably one of the 110s would do a better job. Um, but there really isn't a huge demand at this stage, um, and this is where knowing your soil test, how much carryover, if any, did you have? Um, so, but good points, Steve, and I appreciate that. 
Yeah, still um, any more questions come in, I'll shout them out for you, but you wanna kind of do some inclusions and maybe touch upon this afternoon, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I don't know, conclusions are pain. Um, we covered a lot of material extremely quickly. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm sure in each of your states, you've got good resources of people to talk to. Um, just main goal was trying to give you an overview, kind of some of the hardware, uh, some of the environmental issues, regulatory issues to think about potential impact on the center pivot itself. Um, this afternoon session, and maybe nobody signed up and I can take the afternoon off, but. Um, yeah, plenty of people signed up, so. Oh, shoot. Okay, well, this afternoon, we're gonna get into the actual nitty gritty of um, actual application, um, both of uh, uh, nitrogen and some on some chemicals um, and go through the different steps and different information that is needed and required and it's gonna get, I've struggled with it because it's gotten maybe too technical, but before it didn't seem like it was saying much. So um, hopefully it'll have some meaning to you all. And um, it's gonna actually, there'll be a couple items that'll be carried over from this talking about regulatory issues, but the vast majority of it is completely different material focused on the actual application process. Well, great. Well, um, so Jake, if you want to sh stop sharing your screen, and I'll kind of share up some closing tidbits for everybody. Um, boom. Let's see. So here we go. All right. So first of all, I mean, just thank you to everybody for joining us and for your patience today. And uh, Jake, thank you for the excellent content and for persevering through our technical difficulties. So um, a big thank you to everybody. And before we kind of conclude, I did want to mention that the Irrigation E3 program is open for applications right now. So the E3 program is both an opportunity for students and for faculty to attend the 2022 Irrigation Show and Education Week in Vegas, which is happening this December. So up on the slide, you can see the application deadlines and where on the IA website you can go for more information. Those applications did just open and it'll be, um, we'll start promoting it more heavily, but wanted to give you all a, a, an advance head, heads up on it. So, and then secondly, um, we have some IA teaching kits and student workbooks that are available via the IA website. Academia receives discounted pricing and there are about 20 different topics that you can choose from. So just wanted to also call that, um, call that out for you all if you have not seen the topics. Um, they can be useful for your classroom, um, kind of getting your curriculum designed. So also take a moment to do that. So um, as Jake mentioned, we do have a second session today. So fertigation, chemigation, application based on data that'll begin at 2 p.m. Eastern. Again, each Zoom session does have a unique link. So make sure you do use the one that you received this morning for this afternoon session if you're gonna be joining us. And that is it. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Jake. And then just a final thank you to our sponsors, both Rainbird and Senator. So hopefully we'll see some of you this afternoon. If not, have a great day.